All right, so, um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, want to go over any homework questions that people have, and then I want to finish talking about um, Pascal's triangle and binomial expansions, and then um, we'll go on to the next topic, which will be recurrence relations, which will um, take us a day or two to go through, and then we'll go on to um, talking about some graph theory, which is good computer science stuff. So let's begin with um, homework questions. Any um, lingering questions on the latest homework? I have not, I have not given back the uh, induction homework yet. I'm going to grade those over the weekend. Um, so you don't have grades for, for that homework yet. Yes, somebody just made a comment. I find it interesting how Pascal's triangle relates to Sierpinski's triangle. Um, so, yeah. Um, I pulled up a web page of interesting things about Pascal's triangle. It's from the University of Georgia. And it's got um, a bunch of stuff in here, some of which we talked about. For example, uh, prime numbers dividing the non-unit um, elements on the row, right, if and only if the row number is prime. Adding up to the powers of 2, we saw that a few different ways. Powers of 11, we saw that. Um, here's one, which is the hockey stick pattern, right? If you move down a right diagonal any distance and then make a jog to the left, this number is the sum of all the numbers on the, uh, the rest of the diagonal. And you can do that in either direction. And that's, that's a cool feature. Um, sums of consecutive integers you find along this diagonal, right? So this, this outermost diagonal is all ones, this next diagonal is consecutive integers, this next diagonal is sums of integers, 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2 plus 3, and so on. Uh, square numbers can be found um, Oh, adding these up to get squares. Um, so if you go down this diagonal, uh, 1 plus 3 is 4, 3 plus 6 is 9, 6 plus 10 is 16, 10 and 15 is 25. So your squares are found by adding up um, pairs of, of integers along that diagonal, which is, which is cool. Uh, Fibonacci numbers, which we'll talk about later on today, and we've talked about before, I believe, you can find by adding up along these, these diagonals from... Uh, lower left to upper right, um, but Fibonacci numbers are everywhere, so that's that's not too surprising. Um, <clears throat> Catlin numbers are really interesting. If you take an n-sided polygon and try to split it into triangles, how many ways can you do that? Um, so a triangle, you know, three-sided polygon, there's only one way. A square, you can do two ways. Um, a six-sided polygon, you can do 14 ways. Right, the more number of sides, the more ways you can split this into triangles. Um, if you go down on um, every even row and subtract the middle number, um, subtract the number to the right or left of the middle number, the numbers you come up with correspond to this count of the number of ways to partition um, n-sided polygons, which feels very random. Um, Binomial expansion we're going to dig into today, um, and then the thing that um, that was mentioned in chat, um, Sierpinski's um, triangles. Um, so if if you shade in all of the even numbers, you get this this cool shape where you have a triangle with you know three um, other triangles in here surrounding a bigger one, and that pattern repeats if. Um, if you if you expand this out, you can make this this fractal image, um, and the pattern corresponds to to the even numbers in uh, Pascal's triangle. Um, fractals we don't we don't really talk about them in this course, but but we'll talk about them anyway. Um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with fractals, Mandelbrot sets, things like that. Um, we encounter these in different places. But let me just show you um, sort of my first introduction to to fractals, um, 
Think of a triangle where every side has length of one. Okay, so um, the circumference, right, the total distance going around is three, and the area um, is one half base times height. Well, the base is one and the height is, is something. Um, we have to do a little math. And if you take one half of that, right, you get some area, but you know, it's certainly not a very big area. Um, so, so take the same triangle, one, 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 but split each side into three even pieces and put a little equilateral triangle on the middle piece. All right. Well, if you calculate the circumference of that, right, you have a third times four, so that's four thirds. You have a third times four, four thirds. Um, circumference turns out to be four. And the area, well, you know, it fits inside this circle, right? Um, now repeat the process. Take each side and split that into thirds, like that. And then draw a little tiny equilateral triangle using each of those those middle pieces as a base. All right. Um, you can find a, a pretty small circle, and you can prove that this is never going to be larger than um, than this circle. And so the area is always finite. But each time you do this, the total length, if you were to travel along the outside, keeps increasing. And if, if you run the numbers, come up with a formula for what the length is after n iterations, you'll find that the circumference actually grows without bounds. And so in the limit, you have this, this two-dimensional shape with finite area, but an infinite perimeter. And that's, that's kind of freaky. Right, because um, one way to define dimension is by how your area grows relative to your circumference. Right, with a two-dimensional object, if if you double the cir uh, circumference, what does that do to the area? It squares it. Right, um, but here, you know, the circumference can grow without bounds, even though the area is bounded by some small finite uh, value. And so, so this is an example of a fractal. And it's a, a shape with an arguably fractional dimension. Um, and they get into all kinds of interesting properties. Um, and so, yeah, Mandelbrot sets are another example. In Mandelbrot's, there's, there's just a very simple equation that um, it's a second degree algebraic equation and you use that to to generate a sequence of numbers and based on that you can plot values in a two-dimensional plane you come up with these fantastic um, curves and shapes and images and there's some great number file discussions on this there's lots of stuff on YouTube um, all really good stuff to lose yourself in over a long weekend or a Thanksgiving break um, cool Yeah, good stuff in chat. Um, so Pascal's triangle is is rich with all of these these um, these interesting properties. I don't know computer file. Um, I've always heard of number file. Um, Pascal's triangle has all of these these rich properties, um, and one that we that we left with last week um, or last class. Um, was related to expanding binomials, um, and in particular, looking at at this question of like you know a plus b um, to the fifth, right? And wanting to know know how we can write this. Well, um, if you know Pascal's triangle, right? We can immediately write this is equal to a to the fifth plus four a to the fourth b plus 6a cubed b squared, plus 4a squared. Oh, I didn't go far enough. 
uh, fifth. So a to the fifth plus five a to the fourth b plus ten a cubed b squared plus ten a squared b cubed plus five a b to the fourth plus b to the fifth. And those coefficients just come out of Pascal's triangle. All right. So why does this happen? Um, it's not. It's not just a coincidence. There's. There's a reason, and this relates directly to the idea of combinations, which is. Which is what we've been talking about. Um, and let me just kind of wave my hands at this a little, and and this will will hopefully give you enough of of a reason to believe this is plausible, and then you can think about it more if you like. Um, but you know, when we want to multiply two polynomials. We, we learn this FOIL method, right? First outer, inner, last. So first we combine these two. Those are the first. And then we combine um, the outer ones, those two. And then we do the two inner ones, and then we do... Um, the, I did those backwards, but, you know, the first, the outer, the inner, and the last. Um, what we're doing is we're basically taking all combinations of ways to pick an element from this binomial and an element from this binomial and combine them. Right? So how many ways can we choose something from here and something from here? Well, we can take A and A, or we can take A and B, or we can take B and A, or we can take B and B. Right? And if we add those together, then we get, you know, the product of those two binomials. So let's, let's expand that to multiplying out three of these. And we're going to get eight terms in our product. And we basically get all the combinations of picking something from here, something from here, something from here, and combining them together. For example, we could do a times a times a, a times a times b, a times b times a, a times b times b, b times a times a, b times a times b, b times b times a, and b times b times b. Right? Those are all the combinations that we'll get when we multiply these out. We know that that um, you know, we've got three expressions, so we're going to take three things and multiply them. But we can take, you know, A or B from here, A or B from here, A or B from here. And so this is, this is what happens when you take FOIL and you expand it to, to you know, eight things. So it would be first, 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 last, first, last, first, first, last, last, and so on. And it's like a truth table, exactly, right? And so you can see where the powers of two are maybe not being so mysterious now the way those pop up in, in Pascal's triangle, um, that's going to come back in fabulous form in a minute. So, um, so if, if we actually, you know, multiply these out, we have a cubed, we have a squared b, we have another a squared b, we have an a b squared, we have a third a squared b, a second a b squared, a third a b squared, and a b cubed. All right, here's what you should note. This this and this all gave us a squared b because in all three of these cases we picked two a's and one b and the order in which we pick those doesn't change what their product is the fact that we picked an a and a and a b gave us an a squared b the fact that we picked an a a b and an a gave us an a squared b and the fact that we picked a b an a and an a also gave us an a squared b so if we add these all together, what do we end up with? Well, in this case, a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. Why is there a coefficient of 3 in front of a squared b? Because there were three ways that we could choose two a's and one b out of these three binomials. So this is getting into the choice function right, and choose R. Um, so let's think of this in terms of, of combinations. We're going to multiply these things together. Well, we know we're going to get something times A cubed 
we're going to get something times a squared b. We're going to get something times a b squared. And we're going to get something times b cubed. And those are our only choices. All right? We're not going to get an a to the fourth. We're not going to get a b to the fifth times a cubed. Right? We're guaranteed these are the four types of things we're going to get. Well, the coefficient in here is exactly the following. Given three binomials, how many ways can we choose an A from two of them? For example, down here, right, I chose an A from this one and this one. Down here, I chose an A from this one and this one. And in this first case, I chose an A from uh, this one and this one. And there were no other ways that I could choose two A's out of these threes, right? So this is the number of ways I can choose two things out of three objects. To get an A with two B's, such as here and here and here, that's the number of ways that I can choose one thing out of three. To get an A cubed, I have to choose an A from all three. How many ways can I choose three A's out of three binomials? Three choose three. And to get the b cubed, I have to choose zero a's. And how many ways can I choose zero out of three? It's three choose zero. And if you expand that, do some, some induction in your head, right? You can, you can convince yourself of the following. a plus b to the n will be something a to the n plus something a to the n minus 1b plus something a to the n minus 2b squared plus a b to the n minus 1 plus something times b to the n. I'm running out of space there, right? And this will be the number of ways to choose n things out of n. This will be the number of ways to choose n minus 1 things out of n. This will be n minus 2 out of n. This will be 1 out of n, and this will be choosing 0 out of n. And so that's the binomial theorem. All right, so a plus b to the n is equal to the sum from i equals 0 to n of um, a to the n, b to the, sorry, a to the i, b to the n minus i, times n choose, and if we're doing a to the i, um, n minus i. And that's kind of a cool result. So I won't ask that you understand this deeply, but think about it, right? It ties in a number of different things, um, including combinations, Pascal's triangles, binomials, uh, powers of two, a uh, number of ways to, to form subsets, and things like that. All right, so that's, that's where I'm going to leave it for... Um, for counting, combinations, permutations, product rule, sum rule, inclusion, exclusion, pigeonhole principle. Um, and that's all a topic of, of your latest homework. So questions on any of that, questions on the homework set, um, questions on anything. Well, let us move on then. Um, uh, can we go over some examples from the homework, like problems like the homework if possible? Yeah, um, pick a, a particular problem you'd like to do an example of, and we can run through that.
So we have 2 1, which is product rule, um, 2 2, which is some combination product sum rule, 2.3, which is inclusion exclusion, and 2 4, which is um, combinations, permutations, binomial theorem, things like that. So particular ones that are giving trouble. Uh, 2.27b. Um, all right, so yeah, let's let's look at this. So. Um, So, uh, you're making a basketball team, you have five positions that you can play from, you have 15 players that you can use to build your team. Um, and the, the assumption here is that the five positions are distinct from one another, right? So, um, so this is basically picking five people to take a picture of, okay? So you have, have 15 people you want to take a picture of five of them, how many different pictures are possible? Um, and the order in which you place these people matters. It's not just who the people are. So, um, so this, is, this is an ordered arrangement of five things out of 15. So, you know, P15 comma five would give us the answer for that first part. And it's, it's basic product rule, right? There's 15 ways to put the person on the left. There's 14 ways to choose someone next to them, and then 13, and then 12, and 11 to choose the person on the right. All right, but then in part B, um, it says the center must be one of two people. So let's think of this in terms of taking pictures of people. Suppose we say that there's only two people that you can put over here on the left. Right, you got 15 people you're taking a picture of, but there's only two you can choose from for this leftmost position. So think of this as a sum rule. Think of two tasks. Task one, um, pick who's going to stand here on the left, and then task two, pick how you're going to set people up in these remaining four positions. All right, well, there's only two people you can choose to fill in this leftmost position, so the number of ways you can do that is two. And then after you've done that, you have 14 people left, and you're going to put four people from that 14 into a particular order. So that's P14, comma, four. And so I think your answer is going to be two times that. Does that make sense to people? And probably about one out of 10 times that I do one of these in class, I get it totally wrong. Um, so if it doesn't seem right to you, definitely call me out on it. Um, And this is one of these things where sometimes you shift over to your intuition and sometimes that doesn't work well. Um, but I think that's, that's the right process here. And so most of these questions are, you know, permutations or combinations. If the order doesn't matter, it's a permutation. Um, but sometimes it's not obvious if the order matters or not, right? So if you're picking, you know, design of a shirt, um, the order in which you choose the color, the size, or the emblem doesn't make any difference. Okay. Um, but but if you're if you're um, I don't know, can't think of one other than taking a picture. If if you're forming letters into into a password, right? The choice of first letter, choice of second letter, choice of third letter, right? The order of that matters. So that's going to be a permutation.
All right, well, let's talk about recurrence relations. So, um, so what is a recurrence relation? Um, let me give you a definition. So a recurrence relation is a rule. It's a rule for defining the nth term of a sequence based on the prior terms. So think of a sequence, just, you know, a sequence of numbers. They could repeat, um, they could be distinct, um, could be a sequence of letters or shapes or something like that. Let's just think about a sequence of integers, right? And there's lots of ways we can define a sequence of integers. I could define a sequence as saying, um, you know, sequence n is just 2 to the n, where n is bigger than or equal to 0. So sequence 0 would be 1, sequence 1 would be 2, sequence uh, three, 2 would be 4, this would be 8, and so on. And so this defines a se sequential set of, of integers that look like this. Right? So formally this is a mapping from positive integers to some set where, you know, the integer value 4 maps to that, 5 maps to that. But let's just think about this kind of informally. Sequence is just a collection of things in a particular order. Okay? And there could be repetitions. Right? That's totally, that's totally allowed. Um, and so one way I can define, you know, the nth term of this sequence is with this formula, 2 to the n. And if you have a formula for that, right, and you want to know what the hundredth term is, you just plug 100 in for n, and your formula gives you the 100th term, in this case, 2 to the 100th. But a different way to define the elements of a sequence is with a recurrence relation. And so here's an example of a recurrence relation for this sequence. Term n is equal to 2 times term n minus 1. And this is for n bigger than or equal to 1. So, for example, if this is term 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, if I want to know the fifth term, it's just going to be 2 times the fourth term. Well, the fourth term was 16, so the next term is going to be 32. So this is an explicit description of the nth term. This is a description of the nth term in terms of the prior elements of the sequence. And this is almost a perfect way to describe the sequence, except this only works if n is bigger than 1 or equal to 1. What if I want to know what S0 is? I can't use this formula because they would say S0 is 2 times S minus 1, and there is no S minus 1, right? S0 is the first term of the sequence. So what do I do? Well, I just explicitly say S0 is equal to, and I'll just list the actual value for it. Well, now, taking these two together, I can define any element of the sequence. Now, if we want to know what S15 is, I can't just plug a 15 in directly. But I do know S15 is twice S14. Well, I don't know S14 yet, but I do know S14 is twice S13. But I don't know S13 either. But I know S13 is twice S12. Well, I can keep doing this until I get down to S1 is twice S0, and I do know S0, it's equal to 1. So since S1 is twice that, now I know S1 is equal to 2. And a moment before, I had said S2 was twice S1. Well, I know S1 is 2, so now I know S2 is 4. And I can work back up, and eventually I can get back to, oh, so S13 is equal to, you know, 8,192. Okay, does this remind us of anything? Anything we've done in this course?
Yeah, mathematical mm -hmm. induction, exactly. All right, base case inductive step. And it's not always, you know, the nth term is just defined in terms of n minus 1. It could be defined in terms of, you know, n minus 1, n minus 3, n minus 17, right? It could be more complex than this, which is kind of like, you know, the strong mathematical induction. Um, but, but it's got the same structure as mathematical induction, right? There's, there's this step where we rely on previous versions of this. And there's also an essential base case. And this ties into recursive programming, right? We can write a function that works like this, but we always have to have a base case in there. So let's, let's uh, spin out some code here. a function to find uh, powers of 2. So don't worry about this stuff in the beginning if you haven't done um, C in a while. because I'm just I'm writing some code here to get a number from the user. So we'll call our number n. We'll make a temporary character array. We'll ask the user to enter n, we'll read a string and we'll go ahead and and convert that to an integer and we'll just shamelessly assume that there's no mistakes and that n is the integer that the person typed in. Um, and let's calculate 2 to the n. Um, So we're going to have a function 2 to the, which takes an integer and returns 2 raised to that integer. All right. So none of this stuff is interesting. This is just a main program. Here's the part that I actually want to talk about, is this function for calculating 2 to the n. Yeah, I got so many opportunities for typos in here. Um, all right, so what what did we say? Um, yeah, I feel like there's an extra curly brace here, right? Thank you. All right, so what did we say um, for um, two to the n? We can define it as two times, you know, the previous value of this. We're really just kind of using this notion um, that 2 to the n is equal to one of the following things. 2 times 2 to the n minus 1 if n is bigger than or equal to 1, or 1 if n is equal to 0. Right? So this is a recurrence relation. And if we know what 2 to the n minus 1 is, we can find 2 to the n really easily. Just multiply it by 2, right? So let's just do that in code. Let's just say um, let's just take 2 to the n minus 1, multiply by 2, and return that. There's no exponentiation in here. I'm not going to use a power function. I'm not going to use star star. I'm not going to use any loops. How do I find 2 to the n? It's 2 times 2 to the n minus 1. Right? But if I run this, it will, it will not 
succeed. So let's find two to the fifth. It's going to do a sig fault, right? So the problem here is that this never gets to an actual answer that it knows. It just keeps calling two to the n for smaller and smaller numbers. So we need our base case. So if n is equal to zero, return one. That's our base case. Otherwise, return two times two to the n minus one. Right? So now we can calculate powers of two. And so this is a recursive function described as, as um, you know, a recursive, well, function, <laughs> uh, C function, right? So this is, this is, again, you know, recursion. We looked at this with, with Towers of Hanoi and some other stuff. Um, and we can, we can do this for, you know, all kinds of stuff. So let's say we want to make factorials. Um, so let's make a factorial function. All right, we're going to uh, take an N, we'll just print out and factorial well how do we define a factorial we know we can do it in a loop we can multiply numbers from 1 through n but we can do it recursively it's equal to n times n minus 1 factorial if n is bigger than 1 and it's equal to 1 if n is equal to 0. Right, so this, this was, was something that came up in the previous homework. Right? It's a recursive definition. n factorial is just n times n minus 1 factorial. Well, so, so what can we do? If n is equal to 0, we'll return 1. Otherwise, return n times n minus 1 factorial get rid of my warning. Alright, so put in a 4, 4 factorial is 24, 5 factorial is 120, 6 factorial is 7, 20, 7 factorial is 50, 40, and so on. Right? This is a totally like different way to, to describe a function. Normal factorial program, we would write a loop, and, and in that loop we would um, you know we would go through and we'd have a running product and we'd keep multiplying by that. And when we come out of the loop, our answer would be in our running product, right? This is really just kind of using a different definition of a factorial. right? The idea n factorial is n times n minus 1. And we can use this for all kinds of things, right? So here's a, a function for finding the length of a string. It's called my length. It takes a C string and it returns how many characters? Well, how does it work? If the first character of the string is the null terminator, I return a zero. Otherwise, I find the length of the string starting at position one, I add one to it, and that's my answer. All right, and and our our recursive definition of that might be something like you know length of a string equals zero if string is you know empty or one plus um, string 
1 plus the length of string starting at position 1 in the string. And, and it almost feels like a cheat sometimes, right? We're, we're barely doing any work. We add 1 to something. That's the only calculation we do in this whole function. Right? We never really talk about what the length of a string is, but it's buried in this, this pair of definitions, um, this pair of right-hand sides. All right, um, so we can, we can do uh, various, various things like this. Um, let me talk about a couple of more examples. And then we'll play with Fibonacci's. Um, so let's let's imagine um, a bacteria population. And the population of this bacteria grows over time. So we're going to um, bacteria population at time t is, and I'm just going to make it a function p of t. And we'd like to know what the population is at a certain time. Um, well, suppose all we know is that the population doubles every hour. Right? Based on that, we can make the for following definition for t. The population at time t is twice what it was at time t minus 1. That tells us nothing about the actual population, though, unless we know a particular number. So I might know, for example, that um, at time zero, the population was 10. Okay, so now I know the population at time zero was 10, so at time one, the population was 20. At time two, it was 40. At time three, it was 80, and so on. Right, so there's a recurrence relation. And we can do what's called solving this relation, right, as follows. P of 1 equals 2 P of 0 equals 2 times 10. P of 2 equals 2 times P of 1 equals, well, P of 1 is 2 P of 0, so 2 times 2 times P of 0, which is 2 times 2 times 10, which is 40. And we'll just do this one more. P of 3 equals 2 times P of 2, which is, well, P of 2 is this, so it's 2 times 2 times 2 times P of 0. And so on. And so we start to see a pattern, and our pattern would be something like... P of N equals 2 times 2 n times times p of 0, or in other words, 2 to the n times p of 0. But how would we prove this? I mean, we can see the pattern. I could write down p of 4 and see it would be 2 times this, so I would have 2 times itself 4 times. So this would, p of 4 would definitely be 2 to the 4th, p of 5 would be 2 to the 5th. But how would we prove that p of n would be 2 to the n times p of 0 for all n bigger than or equal to 1. And what's the mechanics we would use to do that proof? Come on, say it. Mathematical induction, thank you. Right? That's, that's what mathematical induction is. When you can go from one step to the next, but you want to generalize and say, I could do this, you know, for step n, whatever n is, mathematical induction lets you formalize that. And so a mathematically inductive proof of the correctness of this solution for a recurrence relation, which is defined as something that basically looks like a mathematical induction proof. All right, so we've got we've got all kinds of of good inception stuff going on here. Um, all 
All right. So let's take a look at bunnies. Anybody here ever have a pet bunny? I broke my hip in the 90s and uh, my partner was worried I was going to sit around and get depressed. So she decided I needed something to take care of. So we were driving around Oakland one day and we passed a pet store. We went in anyway. We came out with a bunny um, to keep me from getting depressed, I guess, when I had my, my, uh, my biking accident. Gerbils count too. Um, bunnies are evil. They're really cute, but this bunny at least was, was pretty evil. It loved, um, doing all kinds of things. It loved chewing things. Um, I would come home, you know, there was a TV remote control and every button had one bite taken out of it. It was like a Whitman sampler. It had like sampled each button individually just to see, you know, what they tasted like. Um, if I had notes and they were anywhere within reach, they would have corners missing, you know, from all four corners because they would sample those. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I loved that rabbit. Um, yeah, plastic and paper and insulation on Ethernet cables and sometimes copper from Ethernet cables. It's all fair game. Um, so rabbits are cool. Um, they, make, they make good pets as long as you don't mind having everything you own destroyed slightly. Um, so let's look at um, rabbit populations, okay? So these are going to be idealized rabbits. So we're going to have um, the following assumptions. Um, one, rabbits live forever. There's no predators. Um, they, they mate for life. And the way the mating works for rabbits is um, the following. Oh, rabbits and cats are so different from each other. Um, you know, this rabbit got under one of my housemates' beds and I was trying to chase it out. So I was, you know, banging my crutch on the floor to try to scare it, right? With a cat, you know, it totally takes off. The rabbit was just intrigued. Kept trying to smell the bottom of the crutch, you know, because it, it had been on the ground. Um, totally different mindset. Um, all right, so um, rabbit population. So um, after two months, you get a new pair of rabbits. Each month. Right, so once you have a pair of rabbits, every month after the sec, starting with the second month, um, you get another pair of rabbits. And they breed like that forever. Okay, so it's a really simplified model of rabbit population. So let's, let's just take a look at how this population grows. So let's start off, and I'm just going to list pairs of rabbits here, okay? So time period one, we have a single pair of rabbits. All right, and, and I'm going to list time going across like this. Or let's put age like this. Okay, so we have a brand new pair of rabbits right here. They don't breed yet. After a month, um, this pair of rabbits is older. Okay, so here's our age. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. All right. In the next time period, this pair of rabbits is old enough to breed. So in the next time period, they're going to be three months old, and there's going to be a new pair of rabbits that was just born. All right. In the next time period, this original pair gets older. This rabbit gets older. And it's 
old enough to have an offspring, so it's going to have a new pair of rabbits. Oh, no, hold on, hold on. I'm messing this up. All right, start off with one one pair. And here they're um, a month older. The next uh, month, they're going to be three months old. They're going to have an offspring, okay? The next month, this pair of rabbits is going to be older. This pair of rabbits is going to be older. This pair is still old enough to breed, so they're going to have another... Um, newborn set of, of bunnies. All right. The next month, everybody gets a month older. All right. But now, this rabbit pair has um, offspring, and this rabbit has offspring, so we have two newborn rabbits. And the next period, everyone gets a month older. All right. But now we have one, two, three rabbits that are old enough to have um, offspring, so we're going to have three new rabbits. And the next time period, every pair gets a month older. But now we have um, one, two, three, four, five new pairs of rabbits being born. And so we can go on and we can we can explore this population and I'll just do one more. Right, so each pair of rabbits gets a month older, but at this point, um, all of these rabbits are old enough to breed. So we have three, five, six, seven, eight more rabbits being born. And so if we look at the total population across time, it started off with one rabbit and then one and then over here we had two and then three and then one two three five one two three five eight and then thirteen and then twenty one all right so this is a fibonacci sequence okay as somebody somebody said in chat um, this sequence of numbers is famous and we can describe the sequence as follows. Start with a pair of ones. And so what's the rule for finding the next term of the sequence? Yeah, so add the two numbers before it. So, so if I take 55 and 89, I'll get uh, 144 is the next term, and so on. And Fibonacci numbers, or the Fibonacci sequence, comes up so many different places. It pops up in nature. It pops up in music. It pops up in art. Um, it's, it's all over the place. Um, so again, yeah, look at number file on YouTube. There's tons of, of discussions about this. Um, and it's got all kinds of beautiful properties, right? So the defining property is that, you know, each number is a sum of the two previous numbers. But also, for example, if you take any number and you square it, and you take the numbers before and after it and multiply them, the difference is always plus or minus one, right? So in this case, the square is one less than the product. In this case, the square is 9, the product of 2 and 5 is 10, right, so the square is 1 less. But in this case, the square is 25, the product of 3 and 8 is 24, so the square is 1 more than the product. Um, yeah, that is a neat property. Um, and there's tons of, of things like that in here. Um, and, and we saw they popped up in Pascal's Triangle. Right by adding up um, in that direction on a diagonal. All right, so why why do bunnies give us Fibonacci sequence? Um, suppose we know the population at time t. Right. Suppose this is the population at time. Um, let's call it zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is the population at time five. 
Well, what is the population at time six? It comes from the following. At time six, right, each rabbit or each pair of rabbits was a rabbit from population five. So the population at time six is going to be the population that you had at time five because those rabbits don't die, they just get a little older, right? But we're also going to add a new generation of rabbits. Now, how many rabbits are going to be in this new generation? It's going to be um, exactly the number of rabbits that were two months old or more. Right? So the rabbits that were two months old or more in the previous generation are the rabbits that were one month old or more in the generation before that, which is the entire population at time four. So the population at time six is the population of rabbits that were already around a month earlier plus any rabbits that were around two months earlier will breed and add more rabbits. And the number of rabbits we get from that is however many rabbits there were that were around two months earlier, which is P of four. And so the general relation is the population at time N is the same as the previous month's population plus however many rabbits were around two months ago because they're going to breed. So these are giving us new rabbits, and these are just the rabbits that were already there. And I believe it was the study of population dynamics that, that first led to, to the formal discussion of Fibonacci series. And so we can look at this in terms of code also. I have no idea what these different versions are. Um, so here's, here's a way to calculate Fibonacci numbers, right? I'm going to remember the, the previous value of the Fibonacci sequence, and I'm going to remember the value of the Fibonacci sequence before that, right? So this is the last, last value, and those both start at 1. And I'm just going to calculate the next term as the sum of those two previous terms. And I'm going to print that out, and then I'm just going to remember the last one is, you know, this one I just calculated, and the last one before that was the last one and I'll bump up n. And this, this will work really well if we don't make too many typos. Right, so there's, there's the terms of our Fibonacci sequence. And we'll roll over, you know, when we get too big for, for a long int. But, you know, we can keep calculating these as long as we like. And if we used a longer calculator, right, if we use something like BC, we would get good values for this, right? So that's that's one way to calculate Fibonacci numbers using a loop, but it's not really capitalizing on this underlying recurrence relation, right? And the recurrence relation at work here is really the following. The nth Fibonacci number is equal to the n minus first plus the n minus second if n is bigger than or equal to two the nth Fibonacci is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1 or 0. So here we have two base cases. We have to define f of 0 and f of 1, but once we've done that, we can find f of 2. It's just f of 1 plus f 0. f of 10 is f of 9 plus f of 8. So here's, here's uh, a better version of our Fibonacci code. I'm just going to, to um, 
go from one to a thousand, I'm just going to say, let's calculate Fibonacci of n and let's print that out. All right. And what's my Fibonacci code look like? Well, if n is less than or equal to two, I'll just return one. That's my base case. If n is one or zero, the value of the Fibonacci number is just one. Otherwise, I'm going to calculate fib of n minus one, fib of n minus two, add them together and return that value. All right, now I'm also doing something else in here. Every time that I call my Fibonacci function, I'm incrementing this e evil global variable called count. And I want to see how many times I actually call my Fibonacci function. So before I call fib up here in main, I got a zero out count. And when I come back, I'm going to print out not only the value of the nth Fibonacci number, but how many times I actually called it. All right, so let's run this. And it's giving me correct answers, but it's taking a really long time. So let's look at the beginning. Our Fibonacci sequence is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. But it's getting really slow. It just found Fib 45. It's going to be a long time before it gets Fib 46, and it will never get to Fib 60. And the reason is that the number of calls it's making to calculate the nth Fibonacci number is increasing. How many calls is it taking? Well, if you look at these numbers, 0, 0, 1, 2, 4, 7, 12, 20, 34, 54, each of those is one less than a Fibonacci number. To calculate the 55th Fibonacci number, it took 54 calls to the Fib function. To calculate the 12th Fibonacci number, which is 144, it took 143 calls to the Fibonacci function. So the complexity of this in time is actually described by a Fibonacci series, which is either cool or disturbing or both. Right? So my CPU is, is just chowing away on this. Right, so I'm 100% CPU bound um, on Fib 1. Right, um, and it's just it's just making calls to this function and calls this function and calls this function. So yeah, so in 222 we'll learn about something called dynamic programming where we'll actually find a way to speed this up um, by saving some of our values. But let's just take a quick look at, at what's going wrong in here. Um, I mean, it's not really going wrong. It is doing the right thing. But, but suppose we want to calculate the sixth Fibonacci number. Well, we have to calculate F5 and we have to calculate F4. Well, how do we calculate F5? We have to calculate F4 and F3. How do we calculate F4? We calculate F3 and F2. Over here, to find F4, we need F3 and F2. To find F3, we need F2 and F1. F3, we need F2 and F1. F2, we need F1 and F0. And to calculate these, we don't need to make a call to our Fibonacci function. Those are our base cases. But all these other ones, we need to make calls. So to calculate the sixth Fibonacci number, we're doing all of these other calls to our Fibonacci function, right? So this is this is really inefficient, right? It's still stuck on F50, um, but really easy to write, right? It's basically a two-line function. If n is less than or equal to two, return one. Otherwise, return Fib n minus one plus n minus two. Really easy to write, really inefficient to execute. And this is, this is sometimes the nature of recursion. So that's recursion, recurrent relations, recursive programming, mathematical induction, all kind of tied in together. And, and it's okay if it leaves you feeling weird, it should. Um, we'll, we'll dig deeply into this in winter.
Um, but this is this is a preview of coming attractions. Okay, let's do one more counting problem. Let's count up particular types of bit strings. So, um, how many n bit strings are there? Which do not contain two consecutive zeros. How many n bit strings are there without two consecutive zeros? So, for example, three bits. There's all our three bit numbers. How many do not contain two consecutive zeros? One, two, three, four, five. All right, two bit numbers. How many do not contain two consecutive zeros? One, two, three, three. So maybe more than half, but let's, let's come up with a formula for this. All right, and we're gonna do this as a recurrence relation. All right, so um, so suppose we have an n bit number. And, and let's let's propose a formula. So let f of n equal the number of n bit strings without two consecutive zeros. And let's find a way to describe f of n. Okay, we'll find a recurrence relation. So let's consider an n-bit number. So we have total of n-bits. All right, and there are two possibilities. Our number can end with a 1 or it can end with a 0. Both are possible, right? All right, and these are n bits. All right, suppose our number ends with a 1. What can we say about these n minus 1 bits? Clearly they can't contain two consecutive zeros, right? But any other combination of n minus 1 bits, as long as they don't contain two consecutive zeros, will give us an n bit number ending in 1 that doesn't have two consecutive zeros. So how many n bit numbers are there of this form? i.e. how many n-bit numbers ending with a 1 don't have two consecutive zeros. It's exactly the same as the number of n-1 bit numbers that don't have two consecutive zeros. So the number of n-bit numbers in this form that satisfy our requirement is f of n-1. On the other hand, if we have an n-bit number that ends with a 0, what do we know the value of this bit is? It's got to be a 1. Because if this bit was a 0, there's two consecutive zeros, and that's not allowed. So if we have an n-bit number ending with a 0, we know that this bit is a 1. But then we can choose these remaining n-2 bits any way that we want, as long as there's no consecutive zeros in here. So how many n minus 2 bit strings are there without consecutive zeros? f of n minus 2. 
So the total number of n-bit strings without two consecutive zeros is the number of strings in this form plus the number of strings in this form. And we've got our Fibonacci series back. And so if I write out all the 4-bit strings, we're going to find exactly 8 of them that don't contain consecutive zeros. So this pops up all over the place. All right, so Fibonacci sequence, that's a recurrence relation, right? We define the nth term in, in, as a function of the two previous terms. Um, there's this notion of solving a recurrence relation, right? When we had our, our population of bacteria, we had a recurrence relation which said, you know, population at time n is 2 times the population at time n minus 1, right? But we, we also found an explicit description of pn is just 2 to the n times p0. Okay, this is a solution for this recurrence relation, 2 to the n times 10 in that case. Is there a solution for this recurrence relation? Is there a formula that we can plug an n into and we get out the nth Fibonacci number? Is there a solution for this recurrence relation? So what do you think? It's a little hard to imagine, but it turns out a lot of recurrence relations do have solutions, and we can actually discuss a general procedure for finding these, which we won't. But let me show you what it looks like for Fibonacci numbers. Um, and my index might be off by plus or minus 1, depending on how you number these things, starting with 1, 1, 2, 3. Um, but here's the formula. 1 over the square root of 5 times the following expression. 1 plus square root of 5 divided by 2 raised to the n minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 raised to the n. And if you plug in an integer n, this will give you an exact integer, and it will be the nth Fibonacci number. And to me, the square root fives are kind of magic in there, because those aren't just fractions. They're irrational fractions. But you plug all that in, you come up with a good old integer. All right, um, that's all I want to say about recurrence relations. Like I say, this will be you know something that we build on in in our programming course in uh, winter. So we'll revisit these themes you know multiple times. Um, but this is kind of a, a one pass of many over the topic. Um, so questions, comments. We got a few minutes left. All right, um, the next thing I want to talk about is graph theory. And graph theory will, will come into play also in, in, uh, in our programming courses. But we only got a few minutes left, so 
Um, let me do something that I promised you a while ago we were going to do on some Friday, um, which is prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. And this, this is a very old proof. This was known by the Greeks, and it really kind of like ruined their day when they discovered this because um, there was a cult in ancient Greece. Pythagoras was sort of ahead of this cult. And they worshipped numbers, and they believed numbers was... Study of numbers was a way to understand the entire universe and perhaps understand the gods as well. Um, and and the natural numbers were whole numbers, integers, but they knew about fractions, right? And so they assumed that integers and fractions gave you everything you needed to know. And they also knew that, you know, if you had a square with sides of length 1... This diagonal, you know, was some number whose square was equal to 2. Um, and when they figured out that there was no fraction that represented exactly this length, that kind of like threw a, a bunch of cold water on their, their celebration of numbers. Um, so this, this was actually a scandalous proof when it was discovered. And, and when they first discovered this, they didn't tell anybody about it, right? And, and one member of this organization actually told some people about this, and, and he was pushed off a boat um, and left for dead. He was elderly, but he managed to swim back to shore and survive. So this is like really, really powerful proof here. And it's really, really short, okay? Um, so we'll do a proof by contradiction. So suppose square root of 2 can be written as a over b. Right? And, and let's suppose, you know, that this is in simplest terms. So there's no common factor for A and B. All right? So we're going to suppose this is true, and we're going to work to a contradiction really easily in just a few minutes. Um, so if the square root of 2 is A over B, you can square both sides. 2 is equal to A squared over B squared, which means A squared is equal to 2B squared, which means A squared is even... And we know from the proofs we've been doing on even odds that that means A is even. All right, so that's, that's stuff we've done. Well, if A is even, we can write A equals 2 times C, where C is an integer. All right, and so, um, so... 2b squared is equal to a squared, so 2 times c squared equals 2b squared. Well, 2c squared is 4 times c squared, that's 2b squared, divide by 2, 2c two squared equals b squared. b squared is even, and therefore b is even. And there's your contradiction, because we assumed that a and b had no common factors, but we've just shown that each of a and b is a multiple of 2. Therefore, square root of 2 cannot be written as a over b, and so it must be irrational. And that's a weird little proof. Um, and, you know, it makes you want to run off and try to do this for square root of 3 and try to do it for square root of 4 or 9 and, and see what the problem is. Um, but to me, it's just a really clever kind of, of uh, demonstration I have no idea how someone came up with that at first. But, you know, that's all you need to prove, that you can't find any fraction that's equal to um, square root of 2. On Vsauce, interesting. All right, so um, I will leave you with that. Um, have a great weekend. We will start talking about graph theory on Monday. I will get your induction homework graded and posted on Canvas. Um, keep working on your counting homework. Have a good one. I will see you next time. Thanks.